Now we'll say the prayer of illumination. God, beyond all knowing, you are shrouded in wonder and mystery, and yet as close to us as our very breath. By your spirit, illuminate our hearts and minds through your word, that Mu may follow you more faithfully. Amen. Please join us in the unison reading of scripture, Matthew 9, verses 9 through 13, on the screen. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher sit with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have come to call on the righteous, but on sinners. I'd like to invite the children forward for the children's time. Good morning. Oh my, how are we doing? There is some space down here. You, we're, they're right down there. How's everybody this morning? So, do you like ice cream? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We should have ice cream every week, right? Um, yeah. In in my house, we have ice cream almost every day. Do you have? Do you get to have dessert every day, or is that like a special thing? Uh, A yogurt, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Anybody else get? I would love to know. I bet you if I asked some of our senior citizens here, they would say, oh, yes, we have ice cream every day in my house. Because why not? Yes, Owen. Sometimes we have candy. Sometimes you have candy. Oh, no, sometimes. Yes. Sometimes you have ice cream. Very good. I don't know why I even asked that, but just... It has nothing to do with what we're going to talk about. Yes. Anybody that knows what their parents, that knows what their children eat, children eat for dessert, please raise your hand and get some, and get some answers. It gets, <laughs> <laughs> what if their kids, what if their kids live far away? They, they should still call them and say, hey, what do you have for dessert? Okay, let's not even, I don't know why I went even there. I don't even went there. All right. So I was thinking in the scripture passage that we just read from the Bible and we read stories about Jesus, right? There's this, Jesus is hanging out with um, these people, uh, sinners and tax collectors who were not, um, and I should say <laughs> that everybody, everybody is, is a sinner, but there are these, these religious types, these leaders in, in the church of that day, who were asking, hold on, hold on one second. They were asking, like, why is your, why, why is your, why is your leader, why is your teacher, why, why is Jesus hanging out with those people? Right? Those people. There's, there's kind of like, when just by that question means they're kind of looking down at those people. Now, I know we have talked in the past about including people who get left out. But to, this morning, I want to talk about sometimes it can be hard to, to, do, to do the things that makes you stand out, right? Everybody is doing something, and you don't think it's right, and you think that something else, that, 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 and you are being invited to do that thing with everybody else, and everybody else is doing it, and how hard it is to be the one that is willing to do what they think is right, and yet everybody else is going to look at you like, huh. Has that ever happened to anybody? That, that sounds like the Bells and Whistle Say that again? That, that sounds like the Bells and Whistle I'm not understanding you. Can you help me? Yeah, um, you talked about this thing in Minecraft, but you don't really... Oh, something in Minecraft that I never played Minecraft, so okay, we, okay, yes. 
Scarlett, you were going to say something? No. Nope. Nothing? Have you ever, because in life, there are going to be times where everybody is doing something, and in you, there's going to be this, yeah, that's not right, that's not right, that's not, you know, and you get to choose whether you're going to go along with the crowd or whether you're going to do what you think is right. Now, here's a heads up. Sometimes you will make the right decision and sometimes you will make the wrong decision. Here's something. Uh, everybody else, have you ever done the wrong thing and gone along with the crowd? Raise your hand. I want you all to turn around. Right? So these are, these are all people who admit that they have made the wrong choice. And hopefully we also also know what it's like to be that person to stand and say, you know, no. You're like, something needs to be said, and darn it, is nobody going to say it? I've been in that situation where, like, you know, is nobody going to say anything? Is nobody going to, you know, and then being like, oh, shoot, Lord, it's me? I have to be the one? And, and then I'll say it. And then sometimes, here's even worse, I find out I'm wrong. Ha, ha, ha. That happens, too. That happens, too. But everybody has to learn and Jesus, you know, and, and I want to say Jesus will help you. The Holy Spirit sometimes will just will not let you go, like, you, like prodding you to do the right thing. But the more that you do it, the more you'll get comfortable doing it. And in life, it's something that everybody has to learn how to do, to be willing to stand out and do the right thing. And it's not easy. I think it does get easier the more that you do it but we need to get in the practice of doing it and to think for ourselves, not always go along with the crowd. Right? And you're just starting on this journey. You know, we, and we've got behind you our stories upon stories upon stories of when we've done it well and when we've screwed up. Right? So I'll tell you, when you do have to stand up on your own, what I find myself doing is saying a prayer. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. And then, then I do it, and then I then I these I might get looks from those folks, right? And then some other people might also think, you know what? She's right, Shh, and go over with you. That feels great. Um, but that that little prayer, Lord help, makes all the difference in the world. Yes, Owen. This is not the microphone. It's the battery for the microphone, and it is talking with the machine over there, which is making it so that it can go. Yeah. And if I had pockets, I could hide it. But I don't have pockets today, so I'm holding it. Yes. Are we still in the ice cream situation? Are we still in the ice cream situation? <laughs> there will be ice cream today. But you all are going to go out for Sunday school for a little bit. Then you're going to come back, and we're going to have communion together. And this is God's reminder to us that God is with us always to help us, especially when those tough moments in life when we have to you know, make the decision for ourselves that we're going to do the right thing, um, even if everybody else is doing what you think is the wrong thing. This is God's reminder to us that God is always with us. Um, let's fold our hands, close our eyes. You know, um, our Sunday school teachers were afraid that we weren't going to have anybody this morning. And look at all of you. So now we're praying for the Sunday school teachers, right? All right. So let's say a prayer. Gracious God, help us be brave when we need to be brave. Help us to listen to your spirit and to your leading and to your prodding, to be willing to, to stand up and stand out when needed. Um, this is never easy, Lord, but, we are, uh, but what you think is so much more important than what everybody else thinks. Help us to make you proud and ourselves proud. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Just so you know, I'm just looking out and realizing that we, uh, um, we have folks from North Carolina and Virginia and Massachusetts. We draw crowds from all over the United States. Our second gospel reading is a, there's a little bit of a break, but it's a continuation from what we read before, Matthew chapter 9, this time verses 18 through 26. While Jesus was saying these things to them, suddenly a leader of the synagogue came in and knelt before him saying, my daughter has just died. 
but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him with his disciples. Then suddenly a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak, for she said to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter, your faith, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. When Jesus came to the leader's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand and the girl got up. And the report of this spread throughout that district. Let's say a prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, two, three weeks ago, when I first, because I've been gone the last two weeks, the I went to... I was on Lake George at a YMCA retreat center, Silver Bay Camp and Conference Center, with the Early Ministry Institute of the Synod of the Northeast. It is a yearly retreat for new pastors, not necessarily young pastors, but uh, pastors who are in their first call. And I have participated the last two years, and I was the moderator of the design team this year. And one of the, it went wonderfully. It went wonderfully. And one of the, the design team is a Presbytery leader from up, upstate New York. And he said to me that he had recently been to a training for new Presbytery leaders. And he said, this was better. And I was like, yes. And I shared with everyone this, you know, what, what Rob had shared with me, and, uh, and they were congratulating me. And I said to them, and I truly believe this, all I did was ask the question, how do pastors need to be resourced for ministry in 2023? And had people, and had the design team reflect on that, and that brought the program together, and everybody knew, knew somebody who could lead this, that, and the other thing, and then our speakers were, were stellar, and it was outstanding. Asking good questions. I, I also coach pastors, just, just a few every month, uh, and it's all about asking good questions. It's not about giving answers. It's not mentoring. It's not me, hey, from my vast experience, let me tell you what you should do. It's asking good questions. My work with you has been about asking good or, you know, as we say, better questions, trying to get at the, the best question. But you ask a good question, and then you realize you need to tweak it, so you ask the better question, and you keep doing that. So the question when I came here was not, how do we grow the church, which is a, lot of, uh, a question that a lot of churches ask themselves. The better question, how do we live in faith in Jesus Christ in this time and in this place, which necessitates a conversation this way. How is God calling you, calling us to be in ministry in this time and in this place? And the answer that we came up with is your mission statement, which somebody knows well enough to know that it was wrong on the board this morning. That we need that we have some we need to, uh, that uh, when that was written down it's not exactly the, your mission statement is to connect with people through Christ connecting with people through Christ to serve the spiritual physical and emotional needs of the community and the world around us which sounds lovely and requires action otherwise it's just words. In the Gospel of Matthew, biblical scholar Warren Carter tells us that chapters 8 and 9, which follow up on the Sermon on, of, on the Mount, are Jesus putting into action his sermon, his words. Uh, he's practicing what he preaches. The beginning of the sermon, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, and now we see him ministering with the weary and the grieving, those who need healing. And the disciples are asked that question, why is Jesus eating with tax collectors and sinners? Because that's his faith in action. 
what he said he's doing. Tax collectors were widely despised because of their affiliation with Rome, and they were considered people without virtue. They pocketed money for themselves. That was you know, widely known. Ra- rabbis, when they talked about them, liked, likened them to criminals or robbers. In Matthew 5, which is part of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus references them. If you love only those who love you, what reward does that get you? Do not the tax collectors do the same? But Jesus answers the question to the, to the Pharisees here. Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call the righteous, not sinners. He answered with words. But one could argue that his actions already spoke for themselves. I read an interesting definition for sinners in in one of my Bible commentaries. Um, And sin can be defined differently, and I think we might appreciate that it's a fluid definition. But I read, sinners are those who violate familiar or community welfare. So Jesus sits with them to restore connection. Again, faith and action. And then the passage that I just read, the woman woman who is ritually unclean touches his cloak, right? And, And ritually unclean means she cannot participate in worship. And anybody who touches her or comes into contact with her cannot participate in worship. And because she's been bleeding for years and years, that means she's been separate from the worshiping community and is suffering from the pain of isolation. She declared her faith by her actions. She told herself, if I just touch his cloak, I will be healed. And Jesus turns to her and says, your faith has made you well. The outsider, the outcast, showed great faith. And then the healing of the girl. It's the father, who's a leader in the synagogue, who talk about taking an undifferentiated stance. That means he's willing to stand up for what he believes, regardless of the, what he, the pushback he's going to get from those around him. The leader of the synagogue went to Jesus and said, come heal my daughter. He stepped out in faith. Touching a corpse would also make somebody ritually unclean. So what do Jesus's actions betray? that mercy trumps ritual sacrifice because worship included sacrifice, right? Mercy trumps that. There is a Swahili proverb that says, a bad thing advertises itself and does not sell, but a good thing sells itself even when it does not get advertised. Another way of putting it, news of authentic good works will get to the people all by itself. In Matthew's context, the book, the the gospel writer is writing in a particular context, and the people who are reading this are more, we believe, was a small community in a much larger dominant culture. Were they concerned about growing the church, I wonder? Making disciples of all nations, as we read at at the end of Matthew, was their call? You know, how do we do that? From this passage, we might infer, infer, be bold, be active, put your faith into action, and people will take notice. Include the outsider, choose mercy over purity laws, live out your faith in action, and people will take notice. I always think that churches overcomplicate things a lot. Just seek to be faithful, and people will take notice. The truth is our actions always betray our beliefs. Our actions tell the world what we believe, what we value, who we value. I don't wonder whether we'll know we're getting it right, or I wonder whether you won't know that we're getting it right when people start asking us, why are you doing that? With those people? 
And our answer might be, because of our faith in Jesus. Bonus points if we recognize that we're all those people. And maybe a better answer would be, because people did it for me. So I do it for others. So our, our gospel message this morning calls us to be bold, to live out our faith. It's so easy to intellectualize it, but to live it out in actions, to connect with people through Christ, to serve the spiritual, physical, and emotional needs of the community and the world around us. I have uh, told this story before, uh, but maybe you've missed it and it's worth retelling. Mother Teresa was caring to the wounds of, of someone with leprosy and a, a man not of her faith looked at her and what she was doing and he said, I know that what you say must be true about your God because there's no other way that you could be doing that. To this faith we are called. Why would you be doing that? Because of Jesus. Because he did it for me. In Jesus' name. Amen.